Hi, my name is Udi Kumar and welcome to the making of the Middle East here on Udi History. In this series, we're going to be discussing the ideological development of the Middle East over the last century or so. But in order to do that, we need to start earlier, during the reign of the Ottoman Empire and at the birth of nationalism. <laughs> The Ottoman Empire was founded in 1299 CE, but really the most important date to remember with regards to the Ottoman Empire is 1453, because that's the year in which it conquered Constantinople and established it as its capital. This is significant because this event essentially intensified interactions between the Middle East and Europe when a Middle Eastern Empire conquered a European city and started expanding into Europe. According to historian Philip Robbins, quote, the Ottoman Empire was a multi-ethnic, multicultural organization for which the Islamic religion was, especially towards its end, its ideological cement. Religion created solidarities between Turks and Kurds and Arabs. In other words, pan-Islam was this idea where Islam united the many diverse groups of the Middle East that we discussed in the preview episode of this series. And it was the dominant ideology in the Middle East for centuries. From then on, the Ottoman Empire began to expand continuously into the Middle East, North Africa, and most significantly, Europe. However, the Ottomans were soon rebuffed at Vienna twice, once in 1529 and once in 1683, and this effectively ended their expansion into Europe. From then on, the story of the Ottoman Empire is a story of consistent decline, culminating in Napoleon's successful invasion of Egypt in 1798. From that point on, European incursions began to penetrate deep into the Ottoman Empire, and nothing symbolized this more than the Ottoman capitulations. The capitulations were an Ottoman policy from the early days of the empire that gave European nations extraterritorial rights. They were primarily for the purpose of avoiding the hassle of using their own justice system to deal with crimes from Europeans in their own land. Though initially seen as a symbol of Ottoman strength by both the public and the government, by the 19th century they came to be seen as a symbol of Ottoman weakness. Following that, the Ottoman sultans began to try to recover from the central of decline that the empire had undergone through a series of reforms from the 1830s through to the 1870s. Though these reforms were met with varying levels of success, they faced considerable opposition from many groups in the empire, but particularly high-level bureaucrats who resented their expulsion from power. Unfortunately, this opposition turned out to be highly successful and the reforms ultimately failed, just as an autocratic sultan was put back into power, whose despotic rule caused the formation of liberal opposition groups who believed that Ottoman society needed political reform that checked the power of the sultan. One of these opposition groups was known as the Ottoman Society for Union and Progress, better known as the Young Turks, who began to advocate for Turkish nationalism. According to historian Philip Robbins, who we mentioned earlier in this episode, quote, The Young Turks concluded the empire was in decline because the Ottomans had not absorbed the ideas and identity of Europe's ideology of the moment, ethno-nationalism. But Turkish nationalism was different from European nationalism in that it wasn't a mass-based ideology. Instead, it was associated with a small number of urban centers and particularly with the rising elite, like army officers. It came to prominence primarily because Turkish nationalists seized control of the Ottoman government in a 1908 coup and deposed the Sultan, rendering his successors only as nominal heads of state. In other words, Turkish nationalism came to prominence because it became the ideology of state. As Turkish nationalism faced a surge in importance and the Islamic solidarity movement began to decline and lose its credibility, it was only a matter of time before ethno-nationalism took hold for other ethnic groups in the empire. For the Arabs of the empire, this happened around the turn of the century. At the same time, Turkish nationalism was becoming one of the most prominent ideologies of the state. However, Arab nationalism would not be associated with more than a handful of intellectuals until well after World War II. Turkish nationalism would go on to be victorious against the Europeans very quickly through a war of independence lasting four years that ended with the establishment of Turkey in 1923. Turkish nationalism kind of fades from regional importance from this point. However, it's important to remember that its main impact on the core ideological struggle of the Middle East throughout the 20th century is that it caused the emergence of Arab nationalism. But we can't end the episode just yet because there is one more nationalist movement we have yet to cover. Jewish nationalism, better known as Zionism. The figurehead of Zionism was an Austro-Hungarian law-educated writer known as Theodor Herzl. In his 1896 book, The Jewish State, Herzl clearly outlined what the goals of Zionism were. He wrote, 
quote, the idea that I have developed in this pamphlet is an ancient one. It is the restoration of the Jewish state. The whole plan is essentially quite simple. Let sovereignty be granted us over a portion of the globe adequate to meet our rightful national requirement. According to the historians, Julia Clancy Smith and Charles D. Smith, Quote, Zionism was both a national movement for people seeking to escape discrimination and a settler movement seeking a state where others lived. Herzl then went on to explain that Jews could never be truly free in Europe because of European anti-Semitism, writing, quote, Anti-Semitism is a highly complex movement, which I think I understand. Jewish equality before the law granted by statute has become practically a dead letter. Jews are debarred from filling even moderately high offices. Modern anti-Semitism is not to be confused with the persecution of Jews in former times, though it still does have a religious aspect in some countries. In the principal centers of anti-Semitism, it is an outgrowth of the emancipation of Jews. The very possibility of getting at the Jews nourishes and deepens hatred of them. Thus was the birth of Zionism. And that's it for this episode of the Making of the Middle East. In the next episode, we're going to be discussing some of the conflicting promises that the British made to the Arabs, the Jews, and themselves, and how this kind of did not go so well. But for now, thank you for watching. Now go out there and make history. <laughs>